Hello and welcome to the month of November. Welcome also to the Fox 54 Week in Review. I'm Kenesha Dees. Here's a glimpse of just three stories coming your way in this week's edition. The classics, the Magic City Classic and the Rocket City Classic that is. And closer to home, how the Huntsville Exhibition Game helps the city financially and on the sports stage. The bacon and a new way to bring home the bacon. A grocery chain new to North Alabama makes its grand opening in Owens Crossroads. And the magic in owning and operating your own business. It can be quite rough in today's economy. We're taking you to a new Huntsville business that thinks they've got the magic ingredient to stay afloat. All that just ahead. This week's top story is a look at the general election coming up this Tuesday. While there are many smaller races in all our counties, we're focusing in on Marshall County and how a measure on the ballot this year could change how residents buy alcoholic beverages. If you live in Marshall County, depending on where you live, alcoholic beverages are not for sale. And it's been that way for years. Take, for instance, the Hog Leg Barbecue. It's located near Arab, but just outside the city limits. It's also close to Gunnersville. In both of those cities, alcoholic beverages sales are permitted at stores, markets, and restaurants. But for the Hog Leg, which is in an unincorporated area, it's forbidden. Now, voters in Marshall County will decide on Tuesday whether to lift a blanket ban on beer, wine, and liquor in unincorporated areas. As Fox 54's Gabe Glassman shows us, it could allow places like the Hogleg to tap into some new business. Picture this. You enter your local restaurant, you sit down, and the waiter comes around and asks you what you would like to drink. Maybe you say a water, sweet tea, soda. But one thing in some parts of Marshall County you cannot order is alcohol. Well, that may potentially change. I think there's nothing wrong with offering beer to our patrons because beer and barbecue go so nicely together. Hogleg Barbecue has a unique situation. When someone can drive one mile in many directions and serve themselves, so it doesn't really make sense for the county as a whole to not be wet. Marshall County is currently described as moist, meaning unincorporated parts of the county are unable to sell alcohol, which includes this barbecue joint, and it's hurting business on a weekly basis. We'll have, um, you know, blue collar, hardworking Americana walk in the door and say, hey, you got beer here? And then we're like, no, and they're like, oh, well, I'll go a mile down the road. But this all may change because of a local amendment on Tuesday's ballot. I think it would be positive for a lot of people and the whole community. Co-owners Nicolette and Gabe Brown say having the ability to sell alcohol will be good for business. We can hire more people, pay more people, keep our money here. Especially for college football Saturdays. We can fill this place up for an Alabama game and people want to have a beer when they watch Alabama. And right now they can't do that here. Some things would need to change for this local food spot. We have seven employees right now. We can increase at least one or two, you know, for sure, if we were to go wet. Nicolette says they would need to go through all the steps in order to sell alcohol on site. I would need to hire somebody that knows what they're doing and can help us all out. But the potential change also comes with some cons. The main potential downside is just people having too much. I don't want to be open to till midnight every night with like a wild, crazy bar. Just because the county may go wet or stay moist doesn't affect this place's future. We already get people here now, we would get even more people with beer. The owners say they're not sure what types of alcohol they would sell if the amendment passes. In Marshall County, I'm Gabe Glassman, Fox 54 News. Once again, only Marshall County voters will vote on this amendment. Election day is just around the corner, and today, folks in Madison County are gearing up by testing the voting machines. At the Elections Management Center in Owens Crossroads, the public had a chance to cast sample ballots and see how accurate the machines really are. Madison County's probate judge, Frank Broderick, shares insights on how the security of the voting of these machines. We've been using this particular piece of technology since 2014. We actually were the first in the state to use this equipment uh, once it was certified at the, at the federal and at the state level. This piece of equipment has served us very, very well. It's very accurate. Um, it's also a very simple piece of equipment. Make sure you go to the polls and make your voice heard on Tuesday. Stay with Fox 54 throughout the evening for results as they come in. A full hour of Fox 54 News will stream exclusively on Fox 54 Plus Tuesday night at 9 o'clock. And for the latest headlines, as the night wears on, visit fox54.com. 
Huntsville Animal Services declares a state of emergency due to overcrowding. The organization says it's been operating at max capacity for months, and they now face a critical situation that threatens the welfare of the animals in its care. They currently have more than 100 dogs in the building, taking in between 10 to 20 dogs each day. Melissa Horn is the veterinarian at the shelter, and she says the capacity of care is decreased due to the amount of animals. Horn stresses the importance of adopting rather than shopping for your next pet. You may be saving a life. You're actually saving a lot of money by adopting a pet from a shelter versus buying one from a breeder. To encourage adoptions, Huntsville Animal Services is waiving adoption fees for all dogs more than six months old. And puppies are available for just $10 through Monday afternoon. So go find your new best friend at Huntsville Animal Services this weekend. Some good news tonight. More than 70 dogs and cats now have forever homes. They were adopted over the weekend after Huntsville Animal Services plea for help. The work, though, they say is far from over. Shelter urges the community to prevent overcrowding by spaying and neutering their pets. The shelter is also always in need of foster homes for their animals while they await adoption. There's a foster to adopt, which means so we do like a 30 days, within 30 days, a trial period, if you want to say. Um, you, and once you decide if you want to adopt the dog, you just come back down after that 30 days and do your paperwork. Then we also have a foster to rehome. Um, basically, that's someone coming in that can, wants to foster a dog maybe only for a month or a couple, you know, couple months. For more information about how to foster or even adopt, go to fox54.com. This is one of Huntsville's most prominent icons the historic depot, but ever since COVID-19, it's been closed and only the grounds have been open to the public, but the buildings, they remain locked. There has been online speculation about the depot with people wondering about its status. We reached out to Early Works only to learn that it transferred operational control back to the city of Huntsville. We spoke to Beth Goodwin of Early Works to learn why the move was made. It is, however, a 200 plus year old building and it requires a lot more than than it does to take care of newer buildings. So yes, the um, financial concerns are a large concern. There was dwindling attendance for school field trips and for attendance even before COVID. But once COVID hit, we had no choice but to close the depot. So that leaves the question, what is the city's plan for the depot? We now have an idea after speaking with city administrator John Hamilton. It's really us just getting it now starting to do assessments of any maintenance requirements and things to make sure the buildings are properly secured. Uh, and then really the next steps for us is starting out a planning process in collaboration with the community to talk about what those future uses might be for both the buildings and just the open space that, that makes up kind of like a park. If you're wondering when public sessions will be happening, you don't have to wait too long. I think we'll, we'll get through the holiday season and probably in early 25 begin that series. And we won't, we won't want to have just one meeting. Sometimes it's hard for people to schedule. So we'll typically set up kind of a series of meetings where people can come in and provide input. Then also us provide some feedback on what we're hearing from the public and begin presenting what those concepts might look like on paper. Train enthusiasts shouldn't be too worried also as discussions are underway with the North Alabama Railroad Museum already about working together. We have had some early conversations with the North Alabama entity and, and so they're beginning some assessments just to see if there's something that, that might make sense in terms of partnership, uh, but we have a ways to go. The city will have to deal with some of the challenges that Early Works did, such as litter. There's a lot of um, traffic down at the depot as far as pedestrian traffic that 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 leave a lot of garbage and things that, that has to be cleaned up daily. While Early Works is moving on from the depot, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. While we were there, we got to see concept art for the upcoming renovations for the Children's Museum, which will start next year. In Huntsville, I'm Gabe Glassman, Fox 54 News. Local families are struggling to get their lives back to normal. Two weeks after they awoke to a terrifying situation, one of the biggest fires in the city of Huntsville in recent memory spread quickly through dozens of apartments at the Fern Park complex. Everyone got out okay, thankfully, but as you can see, the smoke and flames destroyed not only those apartment buildings, but in some cases, the fire took everything those families called their own and left many without a home. Our Gabe Glassman spoke to one family who shares what life has been like after the fire. 
The smell of smoke is still in the air here at a portion of the Fern Park Apartments in Huntsville a couple weeks after a fire broke out, leaving a soon to be mother and others temporarily without a home. I lived right here at 4122 at the very top, the one in the back. Cheyenne moved into her apartment in January. A couple weeks ago, she and her boyfriend had an unpleasant wake up call. I woke up choking and there was black smoke filled in the whole entire apartment, which I was confused because I didn't hear any smoke alarms go off. When Davis realized something was wrong, her first thought was to evacuate. I woke my boyfriend up and he looked outside and there was a bunch of fire trucks and everything everywhere. So then we got our dogs and came down the stairs and that's when we saw a fire everywhere. When they came outside, the fire wasn't near her unit. I didn't think it was going to touch our apartment. I just thought we were going to have smoke damage. But instead, her apartment left completely destroyed. She was paired with the Red Cross for other living arrangements. They put us in a hotel and we have a few days left there. Finding a new place to live becomes the next step. The apartment complex gave her a couple of options after the incident. They said we could either cancel our lease or they would move us to another apartment. We didn't feel safe to stay here, so we just canceled our lease and moved out. Cheyenne is currently 15 weeks pregnant, and this experience has thrown her on the roller coaster ride of life. Moving quicker than I expected and losing everything that we had, and just it's just been everywhere. But even when everything is moving in different directions, the support from the community helps keep spirits high. All the donations and everything and how people were offering a lot of things and helping us in many different ways. It was it was like crazy to see how it happened so fast, how everyone brought a lot of things. Davis says they went to check on the upcoming baby's health after the fire and no issues were found. In Huntsville, I'm Gabe Glassman, Fox 54 News. Certainly a road to recovery. And if you would like to make a donation to help, they're accepted at 3054 Lehman Ferry Road Southwest. For more information on how you can donate, go to fox54.com. As Jordan mentioned, Athens celebrating a big change to its downtown farmer's market, and it was more than $800,000 worth. The project improves the farmer's market in three phases, including a new pavilion roof, bathrooms, asphalt, and even a stage. Officials say most of the funding for this project came from online donations. Market manager Kat Green says this will help the growing standards the community has for the market. When I first started volunteering, uh, most Saturdays we'd have maybe 15 vendors on a good Saturday, and now we're averaging about 40 vendors per Saturday. So um, I think that shows uh, what a value it is to the community and how many people are searching for that type of thing right now. Yeah, well, the 2024 season for the Athens Farmers Market has already concluded, so make sure you check out our website for more information on next year's opening date. If you're looking for a new place to eat in Huntsville, we have a southern spot in mind. Tupelo Honey Southern Kitchen and Bar is preparing to open its doors in Mid-City. From brunch to dinner, Tupelo Honey is focused on southern food with a modern twist. But the restaurant is most known for its honey dusted fried chicken. The chain, which has locations throughout the country, selected Huntsville for its first stop in Alabama. We asked Tupelo Honey why they saw Huntsville as the best place to set up shop. We like to come into cities that are growing. We like to come into new developments that are going to be the new it place in town. And the Mid-City District does that for us. Uh, it's the new cool place. There's lots of music things that are going on here in the city as well. Um, and it's just a fun place to be. Yeah, and if you're dying to eat there soon, have no fear. Tupelo Honey is opening its doors for a soft opening on the 29th and a grand opening on November 8th. Hundreds of customers showed up early looking for deals on groceries and getting their first look at a new place to shop. Well, we had 200 at the door this morning before we opened up and, you know, gave out some biscuits and some uh, gift cards and, and those such things. And we're very excited to be here and, and ready to serve the Huntsville market. Inside, local supervisor Trish Kenny told us a lot of work went into the build out, but it's all worth it. It's a lot of work to get started, but I'm telling you, we're, we're pros at doing that. You know, we, we come in from the ground up and, and get all of our product baked and ready, fresh for you. 70% of everything in the bakery deli department we make here in stores. The Owens Crossroads store is the second in northern Alabama and the first in Madison County. Vice President Rodney Dillard says the company will open three other locations in Madison County in the months ahead. One is on Highway uh, 72 um, and then one's on Memorial Parkway. 
um, we call it Bentley Bypass, where they're putting a bypass in. And then one's on Governor's Drive downtown. Those stores are likely to open in the spring. They'll have similar features as the Owens Crossroads store. In Owens Crossroads, Caleb Aguayo, Fox 54 News. Now, Fox 54 Top Teacher, sponsored by Calhoun Community College. Teachers have their own unique way of engaging their students, and it all depends on the subject. But for one special education teacher, singing is what sticks. In fact, she says she always puts on a show. Meet this week's top teacher, Virginia Abbott, from Mill Creek Elementary School in Madison. We'd normally... One, two, three, number threes. Welcome you to a teacher's classroom. But for Virginia Abbott, down around and put on a hat to make the number five. We welcome you to one of her many classrooms. It's, it's very different than a traditional teacher, but it's exciting. Abbott, a special education teacher, meeting students where they are with a song down or two. Around and put on a hat. We're just practicing writing our numbers, which is where that song came into play. Abbott says she's been a teacher for six years, two of those here at Mill Creek Elementary. Her love for education goes way back. I was fortunate to have some very creative teachers growing up, and um, I think it just inspired me to want to do that as well. I feel like I put on like a Broadway show for my kids every day. It's fun. And Abbott hopes to make it fun by integrating interactive activities in subjects like math. Right now in kindergarten, we're still le learning on number identification and how to write our numbers. Her colleague, Principal Nathan Wilson, sees her dedication. Her kids love her and she loves them. It, it starts with relationships and she does a tremendous job of connecting with her kids. And Abbott says it's that one-on-one -on -one connection that encourages her kids. I get to develop that relationship with them because I have a lot of time devoted to just them. Abbott knows obstacles lie ahead. I just want to encourage them to do their best in school because sometimes they do face a lot of challenges that are different to just a typical child. And um, I just want to see them succeed. Congratulations, Mrs. Abbott. We have more web exclusives like her top teacher surprise on Fox 54 Plus. Also, nominate a deserving teacher on fox54.com. All too often, unused prescription drugs find their ways into the wrong hands. But today in Madison County, residents were encouraged to clean out their medicine cabinets and dispose of their unneeded medication. Today was the United States Drug Enforcement Administration's Take Back Day. These days are used as a measure of preventing medication misuse and opioid addiction. A partnership for a drug-free community teamed up with the Madison County Police Department to help keep cases of, of overdose in Madison County down. We want to get them out of the hands of the people that um, they're not prescribed to and who may be abusing them. So. We want to get them destroyed as, as quickly as possible. People don't realize necessarily that the drugs that are prescribed to them by a doctor can be very dangerous. Um, you know, if it's taken by someone who it's not prescribed for, or if it's um, taken inappropriately, taken not as as prescribed. So, and and then that's one of the things that we focus on is not just drug abuse, but drug misuse. If you missed today's Take Back event. The DEA has a tool on their website to help you find year-round drop-off locations. Their link can be found on our website at fox54.com. On this Halloween night, ask any small business owner what's really scary, and they'll tell you the first months can be frightful when you're trying to keep the doors open. But did you know nearly a quarter of all Alabama businesses fail in their first year? almost half close before their fifth anniversary. And those numbers are actually a bit better than the national survival rate. Our Fox 54 news reporter Caleb Aguayo spoke with one business who are magically defying the odds. A local business in Huntsville is attempting to beat the odds, but starting a store of your own isn't as easy as waving your hand and casting a spell. The owners already had to start over once. We had vendors that were supposed to be reputable, and we placed a sizable order for inventory. And when it came in, it was garbage. It did not meet the standards. We literally took $1,200 in inventory and threw it in the dumpster. Bewitched opened just two weeks ago, providing spiritual objects for people practicing non-traditional religions. They also sell incense, handmade plushies, and other decorative objects. Here at Bewitched on University Drive, you can find yourself some spooky crafts or some fierce fans. But the owners here told me they opened the store for more than just your typical odds and ends. Before we talked about what we wanted to carry or 
where we wanted it to be, anything like that, the first thing we decided was how do we want it to feel? No matter what path you're on, you can come here and we can be a resource to the communities. The shop is planning to add space in the coming months for private tarot readings and alternative therapies, but they're already getting customers right off the bat. I saw somebody else posted a Facebook post about this new store that opened up in Huntsville, and I thought it was interesting. I told my girlfriend about it, and she said we got to go, so we got in the car and came straight here. In addition to online advertising and expanding their services, the store's owners say they plan to make their shop feel like home. In Huntsville, Caleb Aguayo, Fox 54 News. Bewitched Alabama is closed Mondays and Tuesdays, but for the rest of the week, they're open starting at 11 a.m. For more details about Bewitched Alabama, visit fox54.com. Now, another hot zip code on Unzipped. From the WC Handy Music Festival to WC Recording, Muscle Shoals has always had quite the music scene. Our Gabe Glassman unzips the 35661 to talk about its historical tunes. The musical background takes care of itself in the Shoals area. Today, we unzip the 35661, also known as Muscle Shoals. The Shoals is home of a lively music scene in North Alabama. They chose this location because of the, the history here in, in the Shoals area from music. The nearby Alabama Music Hall of Fame has been around since 1990. It has since highlighted the great musical talent coming from the state. I often tell people that this is where music really got its start. I mean, this is where the good music started. A lot of the music seen in the Shoals can be attributed to the father of Muscle Shoals music, Rick Hall. He was the uh, owner and producer and everything with fame. He had so much power and ability to make th songs be a hit. He wasn't easy to please, and that's what it took. The music lifestyle can also be a thanks to W.C. Handy. He was the father of the blues. Each year, the city puts on a festival of jazz and blues to honor what he did for the music world. But when it comes to why people loved to record in the Shoals, when folks started to come in uh, to the Shoals area to record, um, they found this new sound and they related it a lot to the river that we have here. That's where the, the name the Singing River came from, is, is people, you know, kind of thought that the, the river sung. But while the Shoals is enriched in music history, Sandra Burroughs is looking forward to the future. There's a lot of things around the area that point to the history continuing to to set the tone and, and new folks coming up and, and making it very possible for, for more hits to be recorded and sung and, and be from here. So, if you're looking to live in an area with a rich music history, the 35661 has you covered. With your Unzipped, I'm Gabe Glassman. Wow, well for more information on Muscle Shoals in our Unzipped series, go to fox54.com. The job of a police officer or firefighter is extremely demanding and requires only the best in every situation. Huntsville City officials say HPD currently has around 500 sworn officers, while Huntsville Fire and Rescue currently has around 400 personnel on staff. Our Gabe Glassman tells us how new resources will help every member of these crews be ready for anything. Whether it's going through a burning building, or being involved in a high-speed chase. Preparation is crucial when it comes to being a police officer or firefighter. And thanks to a new training site, Huntsville Fire and Police Departments are going to be more prepared than ever. We've been working trying to get this built for several years. And it's been a long process to build this project brick by brick. We took a big board and sat down and started building buildings the best we could to scale out of Legos in the right shape, everything, and was able to show that to the architect and say, okay, this is what you got to get on paper. From plastic to paper to product, the new HBD and HFR training facility is finally here. Police Chief Kirk Giles remembers what he started with years ago. We had one classroom at the old airport, and that's all we had. With a driving pad, classrooms, and multiple scenario rooms and buildings, this will only help officers and fire crews do their jobs more efficiently. We're talking about acres of, of facilities here. Huntsville Fire Rescue Chief Mac McFarland says being prepared is a big part of the job. Three words, life or death. It is that crucial. We live and or die by our training. When it comes to HFR's previous space, 
We had a, a block building that had about five rooms in it, but it's one story, and we could set fires in there and go in and put them out, but we couldn't change the interior. You know, once you memorize it, you had it. They're now able to put their personnel in different scenarios. You can move the walls around, you can change the doors. We can get a great simulation. And this site will be of use for many crews in the future. We've never had a place designed just for us, or for fire for that matter. I feel like this is a state-of-the-art facility for as far as you want to go. The training facility also includes agility courses, canine training areas, and a firehouse pump test building. In Huntsville, I'm Gabe Glassman, Fox 54 News. City officials say the training facility will also be opened up to other fire and police crews so they can be prepared for anything as well. Walkability and cycling across the city is important to LDOT, and they want to make sure it's important to you too. The Department of Transportation made a stop here in Huntsville tonight. LDOT officials heard suggestions from residents on how to update the state's bike and pedestrian plan. Residents viewed maps of areas where walking and cycling is more active through the state and weighed in on what they would like to see. Here's a listen. This is something that we like to get the public's input on as far as trying to find out uh, where are areas that they would be interested in seeing uh, facilities or improvements for bicycles and pedestrians. Safety is a huge issue and uh, we, what we really need is uh, to get more people aware of riders, bicycle and pedestrians on the streets so that they become safer. Our main concerns with uh, this plan are safety and accessibility for the public. And if you weren't able to attend tonight, ALDOT has a public comment form you can submit suggestions to. That link is on fox54.com. There's nothing like band culture. At Alabama a and University, without question, band culture is part of the HBCU experience. The Marching Maroon and White, made up of some 200 plus members, are getting ready for a big performance. Honda's Battle of the Bands in LA. I caught up with two of them. Here's a listen to their excitement and a peek at their preparation. The Marching Maroon and White's reach goes far beyond the home of the Alabama a and Bulldogs. You can catch them out here, or in there. Their sound carries. And for nearly 135 years, pretty soon the oldest HBCU marching band in the country will take their talents to the West Coast. In February, we will be going to California. Yes, 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 for the Honda Battle of the Band. Next year's battle will be at the SoFi Stadium. It'll be hosted by celebrity Nick Cannon, who also starred in the marching band classic Drumline. You can't be in the band that haven't seen Drumline. Junior saxophone player Taylor Hameen is eager to take on the challenge. It's gonna come before we know it for sure, but we're all very excited. We're all very excited. We're, we're preparing hard, long, hard hours. It is very tense, it's very hard, it's very grueling sometimes, but the battles and stuff are always fun and the games and stuff are always fun. So yeah, learning new music is, is really fun. Hameen says being a member of the band is great in more ways than one. We're we'll all just kept coming here for each other. We're all coming here because we know that this is greater than us. We know that this is bigger than us. We meet another marching band member, Junior Nathaniel Glenn. I play the mellophone. It's like in between between the baritone and the trumpet. So it's like the big brother to the saxophone. So I think of like the brass version of a saxophone is what the mellophone is. He's been playing musical instruments almost all of his life. Glenn joined the Marching Maroon and White his freshman year, and he keeps coming back. My freshman class that I came in with, and even the people who I meet now, the band directors, they really have the best interest in heart for you. Glenn says he learns camaraderie and life lessons too. The band teaches you more than just how to play music. It teaches you how to be on time, teaches you how to pack, teaches you how to have expectations. As for the upcoming battle at SoFi Stadium. We, we ready to come with it. We're gonna come hard, come straight. The March Meeting White Band staff is not to be played with. Don't underestimate us because we're gonna come and show you something brand new. I'm very excited. And I'm excited for them. And the marching band has a pre-battle this weekend, the Magic City Classic in Birmingham. Tomorrow, the marching maroon and white will battle it out against ASU's mighty marching hornets during halftime. May the best band win. 
For the 83rd time, Alabama's biggest HBCU rivalry went at it in the Magic City Classic. On top of the pageantry and the overall significance of this day to the community, this game had a significant impact on the SWAC standings as all but two teams entered this week with a loss in league play, meaning the winner of this Classic was still in contention. The loser lost leverage. Let's get to those highlights. A&M looks to avoid dropping a third straight Classic against their in-state rivals. Now the team was able to generate a ton of offense early. Half of the 12 total drives from the opening stanza ended in punts. Bama State was able to use the field positioning to their advantage early. First and 10 for the 31. Kareem Key takes the snap. Finds Asa Gregg at the 35. He shakes Caleb Dawson and is off to the end zone. He goes in untouched for the score. Hornets take a 7-0 lead with the extra point. They'd add a field goal in their final possession of the frame to take a 10-0 lead into the second quarter. Late in the second now, Bulldogs have a fourth and one from their own 29. Xavier Langford takes the snap. It's a QB keeper, but as the blocks break down, Langford is swarmed and loses the ball on the way out. ASU comes up with a fumble. It was the second of two fumbles in the frame, but certainly the most costly. The Hornets rattle off five straight runs to get them to the six-yard line. Then on goal to go, it's a play action. Key finds Derek Harden in the flat. He slips out of a tackle try and is in for the touchdown. It's 17-0 with the extra point, with 2.50 to go in the half. A&M attempted three or more consecutive passes just twice in the first half. The only time they made three straight completions was on this drive, their final of the stanza. With just under three minutes to go, in comes Cornelius Quad Brown in place of Langford. Here you see the final of those three straight passes when Brown looks towards DJ Nelson, who makes the grab at the 19 and gets down to the 10. Two plays later, the Dogs would get on the board for the first time. Victor Barbosa's 27-yard field goal makes it 17-3 at the half. It's Barbosa's second make of the year. After earning just 120 total yards in the first half, any kind of comeback by the Bulldogs rested on the forward pass. And Lankford threw a few strikes that made it interesting in the fourth quarter. So 27-3 with under 10 minutes to play. Lankford finds Keenan Hambrick on the left. And Hambrick does the rest. 65 yards. It'd be the first of two touchdown catches from Hambrick, plus two-point conversions that got us to our final score. In all, the deficit was too steep. ASU wins the Magic City Classic 27-19. It's the Hornets' third straight victory in the rivalry. After the game, Connell Maynor said they just didn't have enough to complete a second-half comeback. Well, we got a great field position coming out after the half, the first two possessions, and we couldn't do anything. We didn't, we didn't move the ball at all. We couldn't get close enough to try a long field goal, and so that kind of killed our momentum. And then we finally got something going late. We had a chance right there on third and long. If we get off the field right there, we get the ball back with a minute and 55 seconds. The way we're moving the ball, it's confident we're going to take it down and score, go for two, and it'd be an overtime game. But you got to take your hats off to them. They made the plays they had to make. We just didn't play very well tonight. We weren't ready to play. I got to take the blame for that. We just got to win out. We got to win out. We got to win our next game. We got to start with tomorrow's film, uh, getting better. Uh, we made two, way too many mistakes. People lining up wrong. It just wasn't very good today. It wasn't very good. We just we weren't focused for some reason. Maybe it was the Magic City Classic. With the loss, AM drops to three and four overall and one and two in the league. They return home next week when they take on Southern. Hey everybody, the regular season for Nate Oates and the Alabama Crimson Tide beginning next week when they take on UNC Asheville. Tonight they got their final tune-up uh, before that opener, and the opponent was no slouch. Over 6,600 fans on hand to see Mark Sears and the Tide take on Coach Penaway. Coach Penny Hardaway and those Memphis Tigers. In the first, it's Sears pulling up from three-point range, and it's good. He puts his team up by a tray. Less than two minutes later, we see Sears make this play again. This time, he's a distributor. Gives it over to Jaron Stevenson from the corner, and it is good. Alabama leads by four. Memphis, you know, they hung around the first few minutes. Baraka Akoji pushes it up to Musa Cease, and he throws it down. Two-handed jam. The Tigers shot uh, under 28% and went 0 for 7 from three-point range. Alabama Alabama, this started to really hit his stride. Clifford Omori gets the rock and slams at home right there. Alabama's physically biggest addition finished the game with 10 points. Midway through the half, Mark Sears shines once again. His return to the 256 slashes through the D and finishes with a scoop shot for two. Alabama led by 12 after that bucket. And the Crimson Tide, they would keep pouring it on. Here they are on a fast break coming up. The first shot will rim out by Mobile native LeBaron Phylon. Skies it up, but uh, on the putback right there is... 
Alabama with the uh, with the putback, 41 to 25 at that point. We got one more good highlight for Measure. Uh, Sears splashes his third three-pointer in the half. He ended the night with 20 points. Alabama led by 20 at the half. They go on to win tonight by a final score of 96 to 88. They finished the preseason perfect 2 and 0. Oh. For more from the BBC, let's go to Nick Kuzma. The Alabama Crimson Tide returned to Huntsville for the first time since 2019, and they were welcomed back to the Rocket City with a warm ovation. The Tide also led by 20 at the end of the first half in their charity exhibition versus Memphis, but won the game by just eight points. Nate Oates says there's work to be done. There's reason we play the exhibition so that we can get exposed a little bit on what we got to work on. We definitely got exposed tonight a little bit. Uh, thought our turnovers were not where we needed them to be. We got to do a better job taking care of the ball. A well coached, dynamic, tough group that's together. That's what I see in Alabama. They execute, and they're very they're very tough. Um, it's just um, you know, Coach Oates has done a great job of putting them in position and, and recruiting character and recruiting guys that he knows that wants to win for the culture and not just for themselves. Super thankful Memphis agreed to do this for us. I'm glad we got to come up here to. Uh, Huntsville, I think the crowd was great. You know, I wish we'd have played a little bit better for them in the second half, but they, they were great. I, I enjoyed the uh, game. And, you know, glad we were able to get a win, but definitely got a lot to work on here. In a week's time, this will all be for real. The Alabama Crimson Tide open up the 2024-25 regular season with a home game versus UNC. Asheville tip-off from Coleman Coliseum is set for 8 o'clock. Big time basketball brought in some big revenue for the city of Huntsville. The Huntsville Sports Commission has crunched the numbers from the Rocket City Classic, the exhibition basketball game between the University of Alabama and Memphis. The total economic impact about $1.2 million. That's money spent at the BBC, hotels, restaurants, and elsewhere. More than 6,600 people saw the Crimson Tide defeat the Tigers and a late tune-up for the regular season. That'll do it for this edition of the Fox 54 Week in Review. Next week, look for more of the same, a recap of the week in local headlines as only Fox 54 provides them to you here on the free to stream Fox 54 Plus app. Tell your friends there's more to Fox 54 when they download our app on Roku, Fire TV, and Apple TV devices. Until next week, I'm Kenesha Dees. Have a fantastic weekend.